Okay, just a minute until we start here. Good morning, everybody. Um, as always, if, if you don't mind, just uh, give me some sign that you're out there and you can hear me and you can see the desktop um, either in the chat or just turn on your audio for a moment and let me hear you. Yes, I have at least one yes. Um, and again, you know, to, to help you guys have some control on the throttle of uh, of the pace of this course take a look at your you know your participants if you have a participants window at the bottom of it there should be some indicators that you can say yes no go slower uh, thumbs up I think you can ask for a cup of coffee if you want uh, um, but take a look take a look at those yep somebody's asking for a cup of coffee uh, get me one too if you don't mind mocha um, if anybody's getting it. Uh, but anyway, the, there's this, this uh, participant list. I encourage you to use it. Um, I, if I could bring you a coffee, I would. Uh, I don't know how to do that right now. But it is a good way for you guys to tell me to go slower if I tend to go too fast through the notes. Um, just don't, you know, don't hesitate to use that. That's what it's for. And as always, the chat is there. And good morning to you, too. Thank you for the, the pleasant good morning. Um, so let's, 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 uh, let's get going. I, I have to say somehow my notes, I had a hard time posting them last night. It was weird. It was like canvas was full and it just couldn't eat any more, any more uploads. Um, so it, it, it didn't allow me to post it in the normal way. I had to post it at an external link. I hope that that was okay. Um, and I hope I never have to do that again, but if you had trouble getting to the notes, um, uh, I apologize for that, but they are there. Uh, and then the, the last thing I want to do, I have to clean up a little bit of a mess that I made last time. This is a simple problem that I was going over last time. Um, when I introduced this in the 8 a.m. lecture on Friday, I noticed that I had a notation problem. I was mixing up my ones and twos. In the two minutes in between the 8 a.m. lecture and the 10 a.m. lecture, I thought I fixed the notation, but I didn't. I did it too fast, and my notation was still bollocksed. So I want to go through this slowly and make sure that I don't lose anybody on this because it's a fairly straightforward problem, and whatever notation you know mistake that I made shouldn't hide that from you. So our idea here is that electrical potentials. I've been trying to argue to you that uh, I'm not arguing. I'm trying to you know. Put this proposition out here that potentials are easier to use than than electrical force electrical fields or electrical forces and why is it it's because they're simply additive um, if I have the potential due to one point charge at this point in space and I have the potential due to this point charge at this point in space I can just add them together as numbers and that's a lot easier to do than vectors um, so the statement of the problem is if I have two nanocoulombs here, and this is a distance R1 from the point in space that I want to evaluate the potential, and I have a negative one nanocoulomb here, which is four centimeters from the point in space that I want to evaluate. What's the potential right here? Well, this, this idea that potentials are additive tells me I just calculate them individually and then sum it up. So first things first, I have to find this distance because my, my formula is K Q over R. That's what I, that's what I, um, that's where I'm going to start. So I have to find R. R, if I look at this carefully, this is supposed to be a right triangle and a right triangle A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So R1 squared is going to be equal to three squared plus four squared. This is my three, this is my four. So three squared plus four squared is equal to this guy squared. I have to take the square root. So if I take three squared plus four squared, I think I get 25. And if I take the square root of 25, I get five. Going back to my mantra of put it all in SI, we, um, we put this in meters instead of centimeters. So five times 10 to the negative two meters. Now, I calculate the potential due to each of these. It's going to be a KQ over R1 and a, a KQ1 over R1. And this is going to be a KQ2 over R2. And 
that's what I got right here, KQ1 over R1, KQ2 over R2. And I have a common K, so why not just take out that common K? It's the Coulomb constant. And now, finally, I can start putting in some numbers. I've converted them all to SI up here. So what do I got? My Coulomb constant is 9.0 times 10 to the 9. The, the horrible glory of, of terrible units that you get here is Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. That's just what comes along with this constant. My nanocoulombs is a 10 to the minus 9 signifier here. So I have two nanocoulombs. The other one was negative one nanocoulomb, so I got a 10 to the minus nine coulombs there. And then in the denominator, I had five centimeters and four centimeters, so five times 10 to the negative two meters, four times 10 to the negative two meters. And if I put this into my calculator, I get 135. If I'm careful here, now, I, I always kind of skip this step, and I, I, I understand maybe if this frustrates people, because if I start with SI, I end with a SI. I want to show it in all its glorious detail right now. So I started out with Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. That Newton has nothing to do with anything over there, so it just carries over. My meter squared is going to cancel out with that meter, and this Coulomb squared is going to cancel out with that Coulomb. So I get a Newton meter per Coulomb, 135 Newton meters per Coulomb. And you're like, what is a, what the heck is that? Well, a Newton meter is in SI a joule. So if you, and that's hard to remember, but you could go back to work. Work is defined as force times distance. So what's the units of force? Newtons. What's the units of distance? Meters. So we have units of energy here, which I know in SI is joules. So I got Newton meter, that's a joule, and a joule per coulomb is a volt, right? That's our new friend is the volt is a joule per coulomb. So the last part that I skipped through in my example, which I'm, you know, I'm trying to just show every little horrendous step as I go here so that I don't, I don't skip anything and I don't make any more mistakes is I rounded that off to 140. Why, why did I round that off to 140 from 135? Well, if you look back up here, this is part of the course I'm not really, I'm not really dinging you guys on. I'm not really holding you this to too much. I'm not really emphasizing it because you're not going to be engineers. Um, you're not going to, you know, you're not, you're not trying to build a bridge that I need to drive over and I need that specific precision. But it is an important part of solving problems and I don't want to just ignore it. So if I have two significance figures here, this is one, two significant figures, one, two significant figures one, two significant figures. All of them are two significant figures. So I shouldn't specify my result with any more significant figures than I started with. So I round that off to two significant figures, one, four, and then the zero, I've rounded that 35 up to a 40. So this only has two significant figures. So I apologize, this is the second or third time we've seen this stupid example. And I hope that, um, that my mistake in the notation in the last, last time didn't confuse what I hope is a, a straightforward um, principle that the potentials, once you calculate them, you can just add them up. They, 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 just, they just add together like that. So if you have any questions about that, I don't mind to, to, to go any further about units or anything like that. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I'm looking at the, the participant list. I don't see any requests. So I'm just going to move ahead to the next thing which is units. So again, a volt is defined as a joule per coulomb, and a joule is a Newton meter. Again, you can think of, you know, the, the way that I remember this is that uh, it takes work to, to kind of change potential energy or to increase kinetic energy, anything like that. It's always related to work, and work is force times distance. So Newtons have a unit of force, and distance has a unit of meters, and my coulombs comes along for the ride in the denominator. If you really, really want to dig down into this and see what's going on, then a Newton, I remind you, you can look this up back in your book or you can figure this out just by, you know, what's happening with the force. We have a kilogram meter per second squared is what a Newton is, is, is short for. And a joule is a Newton times a meter. So a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So in all of its glory, a volt is one kilogram meter squared per coulomb per second squared. 
you almost never need to know that. It's really kind of most of the time all you need to know is that a volt is a joule for joule per coulomb, and that will get you through, you know, 95% of the problems. But I show this here for the people that, you know, are interested in where the units are coming from. Okay, so if there's no questions on that, I'll allow you to digest that, and then I'm going to move on to a little bit more of a, uh, um, maybe a, a, a more of a challenging concept here. Okay, so um, the, the idea I introduced last time was uh, we're trying to figure out some way to, to analyze circuits. And if you look at this mess behind me, this rat's nest of, of circuit behind me, how would we figure out you know, what's going on, what current is flowing through this? We're gonna build up the tools to do, um, to, to, to attack circuits like these, but we'll start slowly. And the, the first thing that we want to introduce is this idea that current, um, the current into a junction, the current into an element in our circuit is equal to the current out. What is this, where does this come from? It's basically a, a reflection of the a very fundamental principle in physics, which is that charge <coughs> is conserved. So you don't want charge as it goes into this light bulb to be destroyed or that, that somehow charge gets created in this process. The charge is coming from this battery at a high potential on this side, falling through the light bulb and coming back to the low potential side of the battery. In the process, we shouldn't lose any of our little charges. They, should, they can lose energy as they go from a high potential energy on this side to a low potential energy. Remember, when I say potential, it is you know, also indicating that we have a higher potential energy on this side and a lower potential energy on this side. That positive charge wants to fall from higher potential energy to lower potential energy, losing energy in the process. It's gonna lose energy, uh, it's gonna I'm sorry, it's gonna lose uh, potential energy. It's gonna be converted into kinetic energy and that kinetic energy, as we slam through the structure, through the lattice of this metal, whatever this light bulb is made out of, the filament of the light bulb, it's gonna bang into, that, into that, um, that material, into that lattice structure, and heat it up. It's just gonna give it thermal energy, and it's gonna get hot, and it's gonna glow. But in that process, we should not lose any, any charges. So this is our basic idea, that the current in is equal to the current out, and that's just a, Another way of saying charge is conserved. Okay, so the same situation here. We have a slightly more complicated circuit. I have two light bulbs, but I still am providing a potential difference that creates a flow of current. The current into this mess is going to be equal to the current out of this mess. That's what we're, I'll, 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 I'll um, formalize this later. This is an example of what's called Kirchhoff's junction rule. We'll get to that in just a moment. But basically the idea is current charge is conserved. So we don't want charge building up or being destroyed in either of these light bulbs. We, we can allow it to have a conversion of energy, but it, it should not, it should not, um, it should not disappear. It should not be created in this circuit. So my current in is equal to my current out. And just to throw some numbers on it, say my battery is large enough that I can create 5.7 amps of current going in here, then I know that 5.7 amps has to come out. The way that I think is the most powerful analogy to this is if we think of these circuit wires as pipes and this flow of current we could think of as a flow of water. So if I had a tank of water at the top of Demerit Hall, and I had some series of pipes that are going from the top of Demerit Hall to the basement, well, whatever water I put into those series of pipes, as long as the pipes don't leak, then I should get the same amount of, of water out at the end. And that's kind of what we're saying here is, I'm throwing in this fluid, this electrical fluid, this current into this series of conductors, and I better get the same amount of electrical current coming back out. So I got to get 5.7 amps out. I have not given you the tools yet to figure out whether the current in this one is larger than the current in this one, 
or what the actual numerical values are. We're getting there, and I hope by the end of today's lecture we'll be able to do that. But we need to have some information about you know, these light bulbs to make that, and we don't have that information yet. But I do know if I throw 5.7 amps in here, I better get 5.7 amps out here. Otherwise, I'm violating conservation of charge and Kirchhoff's junction rule. So let's, let's actually formalize this. Here's Kirchhoff's junction rule, junction law. I don't remember who Kirchhoff was. He was probably a great, great, great physicist or a great engineer. Um, but this is the, the, the law that's named after him. Basically, if you have a junction and um, we look at the sum of currents going into that junction, what do I mean by a junction? I just mean a point in space where a bunch of different wires kind of all touch and are in you know, electrical contact with each other. The sum of currents into a junction is equal to the sum of the currents leaving that junction. Okay, um, we already, the, the simplest version that we saw of this is a junction where we have one in and one out and our light bulb is, is kind of at the middle of this. So my current in is gonna be equal to my current out. But I wanna, I wanna be able to deal with much more complicated examples. So here's a slightly more complicated example. And my junction example here is I have current flowing in from the left, goes to this junction, and I have current flowing out to the right. And Kirchhoff is going to tell us, hey, whatever current that you had flowing in here has to, the, the sum of these two currents flowing out has to be equal to that. So it's kind of like a mathematical equation that, you know, this equals this plus this is another way of, of thinking of this. Okay. Another example of this, we'll turn this around. We have, we have two currents flowing into this junction and one current flowing out. So Kirchhoff is going to tell us this plus this is going to be equal to that. And here, just slightly more complicated. Hopefully you get the point by now. Um, of, of what I'm, I'm, this analogy that I'm trying to make, that you know we have three currents flowing into the, the junction, we have two currents flowing out. Kirchhoff is saying, hey, this plus this plus this is going to be equal to this plus this. Okay, so formally stated, the sum of the currents in is equal to the sum of the currents out. We are using this um, this Greek symbol sigma which means summation. So this would be like, this is shorthand for I1 plus I2 plus I3, however many you have coming into the junction. And this is shorthand for however many are coming out of the junction, say I5, I6, I7, et cetera. So, okay, so how are we doing on time? We're at about 9.30. So let's take a look at a numerical example here. And what I have is, I have a junction. I have one, two, three, four, five wires connected at a point. And at this point, I know because I've measured it with an ammeter or something like that, or I have some, some current meter on this. And I know that there's three amps flowing into this point, four amps flowing in from this branch. And I've measured that there's six amps coming out here. There's two amps coming out here. I have one branch of this junction that I don't know what's going on. Um, and I want to figure it out, right? We kind of put our minds in the state of, hey, we have this circuit and we're trying to figure out what the circuit is doing. Is there a current going into or out of this? And what's the magnitude of it? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with Kirchhoff's junction rule and all this is going to tell me that all the currents flowing into this circuit are equal to all the currents flowing out of this circuit. Um, I know that there is three amps and four amps flowing into the circuit. I know that there's six amps and two amps flowing out of the circuit. I don't know if this unknown current is going to be flowing in or out. I don't know yet because I haven't solved the problem. This is the trickiest part of this. I have to make a guess. Is this current flowing in or out? I don't know. I'm going to say, I guess that is flowing in. And if I get a positive number for my answer, I know that my guess was right. If I get a negative number for my answer, 
I know my guess was wrong and it was actually flowing out. Okay, so that's the most subtle part of it. I'm gonna pause there and let you absorb that before I push forward and do the math. Um, because it really is the only, the only tricky part of this. You guys are, 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 are fine with your algebra, you're strong with solving these algebraic equations. It's here, you have to actually actively put yourself into the problem and make a guess. And if that guess is wrong, you're gonna get a negative number for the answer. Okay, it's a little bit weird. So now I can just solve the problem. I have three plus four is equal to seven, plus i is the thing that I'm trying to solve for, and then six plus two is eight. So I take that seven over to the other side and I get i equals plus a. Because I got a plus, my original assumption, because I put it on the inside of the equation, my original assumption was correct, that the, the actual answer is I'm gonna have one amp flowing into this. So overall, I have one amp flowing in here, three amps flowing in here, four amps flowing in there, and it's coming out as six and two. So if you add these all up, four plus three plus one is equal to eight. So eight amps coming into the junction, six plus two coming out, everything seems to make sense. Okay, so how do we how do we feel about that? Are we are we confused by anything in that, or would you like to talk about any part of that? Um, I'll pause here for a moment. I'll change my background to something sillier, a different different circuit. And if there's no questions, I will push ahead. Seems straightforward. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Okay. Um, and again, just, you know, the point here is make a guess. If you have this one part, make a guess. And if you get a negative number, it means that your guess of the flow direction was wrong. So I also have to comment, you know, if you hear, I don't know if you guys can hear this, but I'm, I'm hearing this thumping, banging from upstairs. My kids are doing yoga. I'm sorry, but this is, you know, I'm also doing elementary school and this is PE time. They do yoga at this point. It was a bad choice on my part to put the yoga right above my office, it is what it is. Um, okay, so let's take a look at a more complicated uh, circuit here. Again, we have a battery which is creating a potential difference. We have this potential difference is creating um, or causing a current to flow from high potential to low. Those, those, those positive charges want to get from a high potential energy to a low potential energy. and Okay, somebody says, I don't hear thumping. No worry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, so we have three light bulbs here. I'm trying to imply from, from the drawing here that maybe these light bulbs are a little different. Some of them draw more current than others. This one's a little bit bigger than that one. This is not a very, very methodical circuit diagram. It's kind of a, a silly cartoon that I'm drawing here, but I'm trying to indicate that, hey, maybe these are not identical light bulbs. All I know is if I throw in 37 amps from the top here, right, I have 37 amps coming from the battery, that 37 amps is going to split into three branches, just like if I had a pipe and it split into three pipes and the water is gonna flow through those three pipes. The, the, I don't know how the current is gonna split right now because I don't know the, the details of these light bulbs. But what I do know is that when those three pipes, those three wires come back together and join at this point right here, that I didn't lose any current, I didn't lose any charge in that process. I could not have. If I have, if I have a plumbing situation, it means I have no leaks. And here, it just means I, I didn't destroy any charges in the process. Um, that, that current coming out has to be 37 amps. So you could imagine that it's some crazy rat's nest of light bulbs or whatever going on here. If I put 37 amps in, I'm gonna to have to get 37 amps out in the end. Um, the specific values of I1, I2, and I3, I can't determine yet. By the end of this, this lecture, I hope to show you how to do that, but I need to know more about these light bulbs and the, the property of the light bulb that I need to know is the resistance of each branch. Before I introduce that, I want to you know, take my analogy a little bit further. My analogy is I have this series of pipes flowing from the top of Demerit Hall to the basement of Demerit Hall. 
somewhere in between it splits into three pipes. The quantity of interest here that would determine whether um, more water flowed through this one, this one, or this one would be how wide the pipe was. So if I have one like two foot diameter, big, huge pipe, it's gonna be really easy for water to flow through that. And if one of my pipes is a, a sipping straw that's you know a millimeter, a millimeter in diameter, it's gonna be very difficult for the water to flow through that. And so we could we could determine you know which one of these has the most water flowing through it if this was a series of, of plumbing pipes. We want the we want the equivalent of that when we deal with um, when we deal with electricity. And that equivalent is called resistance. So I have to close that notes here and open up my second one for the day. And here we go. So my idea here is this, I, this concept of resistance. The amount of current that's flowing through a conductor depends on two things. One is that potential difference that's causing the flow of, of, of electricity in the first place, the flow of current in the first place. And the second thing is the actual resistance to flow that is typical of whatever <coughs> material that you're, you're, flowing, you're fl flowing through. So I have to take, before I, uh, before I, I introduce you know, what's gonna be Ohm's law in a moment, I have to take a sidetrack here Every single time that I've talked about the flow of current, it's because there is a potential difference between two regions of space, here and here, or here and here. And I always signify this as delta V. So delta V is a, 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 a difference in potential. If we don't have a difference of potential, current will not flow. So I have to, I have to make clear that, that physicists and electrical engineers and whoever ever uses this notation long ago became very sloppy and dropped the delta V. And most of the time when you see that potential difference, it will just be signified with a V, even though you and I know, because we talked about this in two or three lectures, that the absolute value of potential doesn't really have any significance. It's only when you compare that, that number to the potential at some other point in space, and all that really matters is a, is a delta V. I'm sorry. But the way that the convention has, has propagated over the centuries is people just got lazy and dropped the delta V. And a lot of times you'll see V signifying that difference of potential. Almost always that's what you'll see. Okay, so just keep that in mind. It's a little bit of a, you know, a conceptual um, quicksand there that you might get stuck in. But if you're aware of it, you can just step right over it. So here's Ohm's law. This is named after Mr. Ohm. I don't Mr. Ohm was a great man that I don't remember much about, um, but he was he he came up with one of the first quantifiable rules of circuit theory of this you know flow of current, and it's basically saying in a, an equation the words that I just said, which is that if we want to flow a current, we have to create a potential difference, and the flow of current in a circuit is going to be proportional to how big that potential difference is and inversely proportional to the resistance. Here's my little circuit here. I have a battery that's creating that potential difference from this point to that. <coughs> so I have a potential difference across this resistance. Um, this is the generic symbol for a something that resists flow, a conductor that, you know, something that I have current flowing through it and it has some resistance to that flow of current is this jaggedy kind of toothy line here. Um, so this could be a light bulb, this could be a, a, a curling iron, this could be your iPhone, this could be anything that, you know, has a, a flow of current going through it. Um, and my Ohm's law is going to tell me that the current flowing through this circuit, through this current, this circuit element, is directly proportional to the voltage difference and inversely proportional to this thing called resistance, which will, you know, we will... I don't think by the end of this class, but we will very shortly be able to calculate this, this quantity um, from first principles. So another simple way to write it is, as I said, people drop the delta and just, it's implied that there's a potential difference across this resistor. I, I get a current flow through the resistor if I create a potential difference across that resistor. 
And probably if you have come across Ohm's law at any point in your life, either in high school or a previous class, or just you know through some kind of use of it in chemistry or biology, you probably see it in this form, which is this most common form, V equals IR, where V is our potential, and it's measured in volts. I is our current, which is measured in amps, and that's a coulomb per second. And the resistance, which is our new quantity here, R is measured in units called ohm, out of great respect to Mr. Ohm, who formulated this law. So V equals IR, although I do encourage you that this kind of formulation, although it's not as easy to write, or it's not as beautiful to write, it does enca encapsulate a little bit better the meaning of this law that if I create a potential difference, I'm gonna cause a current to flow, right? The current flow is directly proportional to how large the potential difference is that's creating that, that, um, that current flow. Okay, so there's Ohm's law. And let's throw a couple numbers in here and see what we can do with this. Um, a typical light bulb, so I have a potential difference. I'm setting up a potential difference and it's across this light bulb. The light bulb, I am stepping into our new kind of um, more formal way of, of, of talking about this or drawing these. And the light bulb is just a resistance. And it doesn't matter that it's a light bulb, it doesn't matter whether it's a curling iron, it doesn't matter whether it's, um, I don't know, a power drill or something like that. It's a resistance that resists the flow of current. So I draw it with this kind of toothy, jaggedy line and I put the R next to it. I have a current flowing in there that's caused by the potential difference. Again, I'm cheating a little bit or I'm being lazy or whatever you want to say. By You can see I originally had the delta in here and I erased it because the, the convention usually is just to show the, the V here instead of the delta V. But that potential difference from the top of this battery across this to the bottom of the battery, remember we can't flow current from that positive to this way. So it takes the long way around through your, through your light bulb or through whatever the circuit element is. And if the numbers for a typical light bulb, if I put a 120 volt potential difference across this light bulb, then if I know the resistance of this light bulb is 240 ohms, that's just a typical number for this tungsten filament that is, is wrapped up in the, in the light bulb. The, it's kind of not an LED, but the old incandescent light bulbs that you can see this little wire inside. That 240 ohms, okay, what's the current that's gonna flow through this? I've created a potential difference. It's going through this resistance. What's the current gonna be? I just used Mr. Ohm's law. V over R, 120 divided by 240. It's in SI, volts and ohms, so I'm gonna get SI, which is amps, and I get 120 divided by 240 is a half an amp. Okay, so here's our first, you know, first um, application of Ohm's law, and this is gonna tell us how our circuit here, just a single resistance, um, is gonna to respond to the application of that potential difference. I can't believe you can't hear that thumping because it feels like my kids are going to come through the roof right now. Hope they're not getting hurt. Um, but they're doing some kind of crazy, you know, frozen yoga or something this morning. Um, so here's, here's, our, here's, our, uh, here's our circuit. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause here. I'm going to let you kind of absorb that. If you have questions, throw them into the chat. I am going to... Um, roll into a clicker kind of question here just to see if we're if we're doing okay with this okay so here's your clicker question so get out your clicker poll thing whatever and i'll i'll launch that in a moment um okay so hopefully right now you can see the question. The question is, I have a, a, a capacitor. I've taken a wire and connected it from the positive to the negative. We know there's a potential difference between the positive and negative plates of a, of a conductor. So if I, if I connect a conductor between them, 
current's going to want to flow from that positive to the negative. And in this case, I have flown it through two light bulbs. And what I want you guys to answer is, what's the you know what can you tell me about the 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 current through one and two? Is um, is one greater than two? Is two greater than one? Or is one equal to two? So let me launch that poll. And hopefully you can see that. Okay, we got 59% voting, 70% voting. Looks like you guys are kind of crushing this one, which I'm happy about. Okay, I'll give this another, we got 94% voted. I'm assuming that maybe some people are dialed in by phone and, and don't have a way of, of answering, or if you just don't want to answer, that's okay too. Uh, I got 94%, so I'm gonna end this and end poll. Hopefully I can share the results with you. So we got 89% um, of you chose number C. Let's take a look behind the curtain. The answer is yes, C. And this is just, you know, this is an application of Kirchhoff's junction rule. It's a slightly more complicated junction than our first initial junction. Because I'm coming in and then I'm coming out and I'm coming in and I'm coming out. But the current into this junction is equal to the current out of that junction. That becomes the current into this junction and then the current out of that junction. So this equals this equals this. And all together I can say that the current, I don't know what it is, right? I didn't tell you the potential difference. I didn't tell you the resistance. But I do know that the current going into this mess has to be the current going out of this mess. Okay. Um, let me put that aside for a moment. For those who are asking about it, there's an update on Bo. He's doing pretty good. He now can climb into tree houses, so we're pretty proud of him as far as that goes. Um, he's doing pretty good adjusting to life out of the shelter. And let's see if we can push forward ahead with um, calculating resistances. So we have this idea of resistance. I want to give you some tools for, for calculating those resistances. And the basic idea here is I want to take a simple, simple model, a simple model of um, of a conductor as a wire, right? As a length of conducting material. And that, that wire, say this is copper or tungsten or nickel or iron or something like that, has a length L and a cross-sectional area A. And what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna find is the resistance of that wire. This could be the, this could be the tungsten filament in a light bulb. It could be the heating element in your curling iron. It could be anything at all, as long as it's a resistance. The actual resistance value, that ohms value that I'm gonna that I'm gonna get from um, that's that I need to apply in, in Ohm's law is going to be proportional. Let me make this a little bit smaller so it can kind of fit in the screen. Um, it's gonna be proportional to the length of this. So you can imagine this kind of makes sense, right? The longer the distance that this charge has to, has to pass through, um, the more resistance it's gonna have to the to passing because it, there's more things that it gets to, to bump into along the way. The, that's the L, the length of this wire. The cross-sectional area, the analogy here is kind of like with my water pipe. If I make that pipe larger, it's gonna allow more, more more water to flow through. Same thing here with my current. If I open that up, it's going to allow more, more current to flow through. And the last part of this, it's gonna be proportional to the length. It's gonna be inversely proportional to the area because the biggest area is gonna, is gonna allow more flow and there's gonna be smaller resistance. It's gonna be proportional to length because the longer it is, the more stuff it has to bang into and the more trouble it will have. 
um, getting to the end of that conductor. And then there's got to be something that, you know, discriminates between whether that, that conductor, that thing that the current is flowing through is um, very, you know, allows the passage of current very easily, like a metal would, or if it doesn't really allow the passage of current very well, like wood or plastic or something like that. And this new thing we call the resistivity. This little guy here is a Greek rho, a new, you know, a new, new letter for your, your lexicon here. Um, the resistivity, and it's measured in ohm meters in order to get ohms in the end. So length is meters, this is meters squared. We need another, um, we want to get rid of, we want to get rid of both of those meters. So I need a meter here and a leftover getting an ohm. So ohm meter times meter gives me ohm meter squared, and then I'm dividing by meter squared, and that just gives me ohms, which I need for resistance. So this is a number that's different for every single, um, every single material. And some typical values I'll throw up here. If we have what's, you know, a, a good conductor, a good conductor would be like a metal, like copper, iron, or tungsten. And typical values for this, is something like 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight ohm meters. So you can see here that this, if I put in a small number for this, um, for this resistivity, I'm going to get a small number for this big R over here. So the resistance is small for these good conductors. And I have a question in the chat. Why does a larger area equal less R? Intuitively, I think a larger area would mean more resistance. Good question. Um, so basically the, the idea that I could, that I could get here, let me see if I have a, a demo that I can share that maybe elucidates this. So I can explain this in words, and the, the best way that I could explain it in words is, um, is that this analogy to the flow of a fluid. It really, the current, the charge, we're talking about billions and billions in Avogadro's number of charges flowing through this, through this conductor. It really does act like a fluid, and the more cross-sectional area that you have for the fluid to flow through, the easier for that fluid is going to be able to get through. Um, that's just my hand-waving, you know, wordsy way of doing it. Maybe we can look at this demo that might um, show things a little bit better. So here we have the same exact formula. That's, this is a fancier row than I wrote, but it's row length of the, length of the conductor over the cross-sectional area of the conductor. Um, what's going to matter here, the resistivity is some property of, of the material. The length, right, if we, if we make it longer, it has more of these little things to bang into the lattice of this conductor as, you know, my current's going from left to right. But if I increase the area, well, it just gives me more space to get around those conductors. It just gives me more more room to to get from left to right and the, the the best analogy that i can get is is that flowing of water if you try to get a lot of water through a little straw it's gonna it's gonna be difficult if you try to get a lot of water through a you know a stove pipe it's gonna be a lot a lot easier so i hope i hope that that helps um and then the resistivity itself is going to be some kind of characteristic of how difficult it is for our charge, these little black dots are supposed to be characteristic of the, the conductor itself. So if I, if I increase the number of things that my charges are gonna bang into as it's moving from left to right, the resistance becomes much greater. If I reduce the number of things that it's gonna bang into as it goes from left to right, then my resistance is going to fall. Okay, we get a make sense now. Uh, thank you. I'm glad that that kind of hopefully helped a little bit. And then while I'm at it, I think, okay, let me finish up my notes. We're getting close to the end of the lecture, so thank you all for your patience. Um, I'm going to stop you at the same place I stopped the 8 a.m. session. But what I did was I showed some, I showed some typical values for, for re, uh, resistivities, right? And here's another, another um, 
bit of quicksand that we can step in. The words are so similar, resistance and resistivity. Resistance is going to be this number in ohms. Resistivity and, and, it, and that number in ohms, I could use that number to apply to anything at all. Um, it has no specification whether the material is a piece of tungsten or a piece of copper or a piece of seaweed or you know anything like that. The resistivity is a number that is specific to the type of material that you're talking about. Copper, iron, and tungsten metals have very low resistivity. So, nope, I'm right in the middle of the lecture, huh? All right, come on over and, yeah, what's up? Oh, can I have um, my computer? No, I'm busy right now. Give me five minutes, I'll be right up, okay? Love you. All right, um, so the, the resistance is going to be proportional to resistivity. And if that resistivity is small, then the resistance is going to be small. There's this group of materials, these metals, are going to be um, called conductors just because they have such low resistivity. And poor conductors like seawater, muscle, fat, will still allow that passage of charge, but with, with more resistance than you would get from these good conductors. One other thing that we will circle back to is the fact that muscle and fat in your arm, in your body, has different resistivities. They have a different response to the passage of current through it. And we can use that in a very nice way to discriminate between muscle and fat in your body. And this is if you've ever gone into the, P, the physical therapist and they, you know, they make you grab something like this. And what they're doing is they're putting a current through your body and measuring, you know, measuring the resistance of your body. And because the muscle and the fat will have different um, resistivities, you can discriminate how much muscle and how much fat you have, your body fat percentage. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. But that discrimination between materials can be very useful for determining what kind of material you have. You just put a, put a potential across it and measure the current and then figure out what the, the resistivity of that material is and you can kind of figure out what the material is. And we'll, 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 we'll do an example about that. The last type of material that I want to talk about is uh, an insulator and an insulator is something that has poor um, poor uh, ability to allow the passage of current we would call that poor conductivity or very large resistivity and this resistivity see these now are at the order of 10 to the <coughs> 15 10 to the 21 plastic is a good insulator right it does not allow for the passage of current very easily and if we put a big number in here for resistivity, my resistance is going to become very large. So different types of materials. I don't need you to memorize any of these numbers, but I do want you to know that conductors have low resistivity, insulators have high resistivity. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. We have two minutes left. I, I, I don't like to drag over into the next class, and I like to give you some chance to um, Ask questions if you would like to, but that is the new material for the day. And I thank you all for your attention and for your patience. Feel free to um, put some questions in the chat. You are welcome, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Very welcome, Troy. Very welcome, Amelia.